Hey, brother. Hey, bro. How's it going? Ready to do a little bit of blast in here. Good to see you. I see you got the grease gun out. Yeah, a little piece of history here today, Larry. The M3 submachine gun is commonly referred to as the grease gun, owing to its visual similarity to the common mechanics tool. The M3's comparatively low cyclic rate was a function of the relatively low pressure generated by the 45 ACP round, a heavy bolt, and recoil springs with a lighter than normal compression rate. The M3 fed from double column single feed detachable box magazine, which held 30 rounds and was patterned after the British Sten magazine. Brought out what you and I both consider the modern day grease gun. Oh yeah, the 45 UMP. You're right, the modern day counterpart. The UMP is a blowback operated magazine fed submachine gun firing from a closed bolt. This one fires in 45 ACP, but it also comes in nine millimeter and 40 Smith and Wesson. The 45 version is specifically meant to bring more punch than a nine millimeter MP5. Most submachine guns feel heavy for their size, a quality that helps with recoil when firing on full auto. But the UMP is different. It feels pretty lightweight and it's actually kind of bulky for a submachine gun. To counter the lightweight of the gun and still keep it accurate on fully auto, HK reduced the cyclic rate down to fire roughly 600 to 650 rounds per minute. It actually could have had a much higher cyclic rate of fire than that. Operationally, lighter is usually better than heavy as long as performance doesn't suffer. I think the UMP succeeds here. Just like the grease gun, the UMP was meant to be a more cost-effective weapon than its predecessor. The grease gun was meant to replace the Thompson, and the UMP was designed to replace the MP5. Now, one of the things I want to talk about today is the similarities between the UMP and since you've got it here, the grease gun. Oh yeah. Even though they really came from two needs and necessities, they both really, this is without a doubt, you and I agree, the modern day version of the grease gun itself. Absolutely, but the parallel of application is so similar, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. Obviously, a, probably a far superior gun. Right. But, but the roles they fill are pretty much- Very uh, similar. Very similar. And then, very simple gun, easy to manufacture, much like that one. Exactly. And of course, also inexpensive. Yeah, as, as we know, when this gun was, the developed, it was designed to replace the expensive Thompson submachine gun. So as far as the money involved in the manufacturers, you know, it's all stampings, look pretty crude looking. As a matter of fact, you know, it got the nickname the grease gun because that's kind of what most soldiers thought it looked like. Um, extremely rugged, you know, one of the drawbacks, eight pounds empty. What's the weight on that? That's about a five pound gun yeah. because of the polymer. Because of the polymer. Yeah. Eight inch barrel. Right, and that's about the same. The UMP is about the same. 450 round per minute cyclic rate. Well, this one's about 650. The one thing this has going for it, that doesn't. This is select fire, semi or full auto. You and I both know you can do that with the grease gun, but you have to get off that trigger. Yeah, exactly. You got it. It's all trigger control. It's all trigger control. And we could certainly argue, you know, one of the problems with the grease gun is basically to load it, especially in the original M3, you had a cocking lever, you cock, but at this point, to make it safe, the only way you could really do it was retract the bolt slightly, close the dust cover, which locked the bolt, and that was your safety. Right. That, and you and I both know, it's a little hokey. That's kind of a recipe for an AD. As a matter of fact, most soldiers carried the gun with the bolt forward, a loaded magazine in place. And the way they put the gun into action, of course, you had to open the dust cover. But the way they put it into action was reach up and grab the charging end and charge it. So clearly a slower gun to put into into a fire mode than say a modern gun like the UMP. Well, one thing I've noticed, you've got an original M3, not an M3A1, which is somewhat of a rare gun. Yeah, as a matter of fact, clearly there were problems you can imagine in combat, these things often got bent, dropped, or banged into things, and they realized it was a bit of an issue. So the lever was basically did away with, and they went to the M3A1, which basically had a big hole in the, in the bolt, and the way you cocked it, you put your finger in it, pull it back and cocked it. Which, by the way, when your hands are cold or wet, muddy, bloody, that was a recipe to disaster. Yep. If it slipped off, bang, you had an AD. And then on top of that, they also had that little L-shaped piece of metal that helped you load the magazine. Charge the magazine. Now, one of the interesting things about the early one, like model like this, as you know, is really the front of the, of the stock is actually threaded. 
there's actually a threaded array, you could actually put a clean brush in it and clean your barrel. Use when you would, it took the stock off, it had a double application. Really a pretty cool gun, and despite the fact it had a double column magazine and went into single position feed, much more reliable than people get it credit for and was in service longer than any other submachine gun in U.S. history by far. Most people don't realize, particularly within the Armored Corps, the M3 grease gun was still in use, for example, up to the time of the first Iraq conflict, when most of the M1 Abrams actually still had grease guns in them as the gun that the armored troops would use they had to fight off troops at close quarters. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Hey, thanks for watching the Vickers Tactical YouTube channel. To subscribe, click here. And to watch some of my favorite videos, click here. Have a good one. LAV out.